Hello, everyone, and welcome to our movie show. I'm Kevin Gastola, and I'm joined by Chip Gibbons, and we're here to talk with you about our movies for the month of March. How's it going, Chip? It's going pretty um, it's pretty well, pretty well. You know, it's been a it's been going pretty well. Yes, I don't know what day just your personal be. life. I'm not asking you to make judgments on the state of the world. We're just uh, state of the world here. is pretty bad. State of the world just, is pretty bad, but uh. But we're, we're just here to talk about us and uh, a couple films. Both films and about how to say the rule is pretty bad. So we have a uh, really potentially, good escapism well. Potentially illustrative of uh, of some of the current state of affairs. But also, you know, it's uh, reflections on past history and et cetera. So um, it's, it's not going to be exact. And nonetheless, uh, just, just one quick thing from me uh, as a... Uh, total aficionado of, of film. I just would like to say that uh, uh, it was a little disappointing to see that William Hurt died yesterday um, at the age of 71. He's somebody I've always enjoyed seeing in film. So I just thought I'd throw out there. And you know, I think people um, who are from our line of work, no broadcast news is something that they they, they think is a, a pretty stellar film that he did. But then uh, I'm more familiar with like the history of violence from Cronenberg. My favorite of his though is not one that he was probably even associated with. But I really like the neo noir sci fi Dark City. I don't know if you've ever watched that. No, film. I, I haven't seen any of these films. I have to confess. I should watch. All yeah, of them. Uh, this this is an underrated. Uh, most people don't know of it. Uh, was mid it like 90s, 95, 96? Yeah, yeah. And um, William Hurt is an inspector in it. But the whole thing is that basically this, the main character uh, discovers that he's in this world that's being artificially, he's in the city that's being uh, created and controlled by what, what, what seem to be extraterrestrial beings, um, but it starts off as like your run of the mill cookie cutter film noir. I'm not spoiling anything. Yes, but. I I was way too young to have seen this when it came out, but I remember trailers being on it on TV all the time. Yeah, I, I distinctly remember the image of having this wheel thing tied there. That that's that's the cover of it. Um, like I had that image in my mind. It's '98, but I definitely remember seeing trailers for it on TV as a very small child. Yeah. And and William Hurt uh, was in it. And again, anything, I feel confident in saying anything I ever saw William Hurt do, there was like an intensity to it that always was, it, uh, that always held my attention. And, uh, you know, uh, 71, like, uh, there's a lot of older actors you, you, you wish uh, he could have had another 10 years because you know there's more roles he could have played. A lot of people who are uh, legends, screen legends, have, they, they continue to act into their 80s. Like Christopher Plummer was in his 80s before he died and, and continued to do roles. So I just know that we've lost the opportunity to see some more incredible performances. But anyways, to our films, unless there's something you want to say from the last week um, no, no. Or, or month, uh, to our films, uh, your film that you're going to share your love for tonight is Wind That Shakes the Barley. So let's do it. Yeah, The Wind That Shakes the Barley is one of my all-time favorite films. Uh, all three films I've done so far have been like like top ten favorites of mine. Um, I watch The Wind That Shakes the Barley every year on St. Patrick's Day or around St. Patrick's Day. So since it is the month of March, I, I thought I would I would do it. Uh, films that are have good politics aren't always good films, and films that are good films don't always have good politics. It's sort of hard sometimes to make a a, a good a good mark a good film um, that is politically has a politically savvy point of view without becoming overly didactic. Uh, but this film really succeeds on both levels. It is it won the Palme d'Or at the 2006 Cannes Film Festival, Cannes Film Festival. Uh, it really is a, a well respected and just really well done film. It also has very sort of um, phenomenal uh, political exploration uh, of sort of the contradictions inherent in, in a national liberation struggle in a way 
that I think in any other hands would be extraordinary didactic and unwatchable. And this, this, in this case, it works really well. It's directed by Ken Loach, who is a Marxist. I believe he was recently purged from the Labour Party. He was a supporter of Corbyn. He has done a lot of left-wing films. And, you know, he describes the film as uh, every time a colony wants independence. Oh, let me, let me take a step back for a minute. I'm sorry. So the film is about two events in Irish history, the Irish War of Independence and the Irish Civil War. Uh, I'm not a historian of Ireland, but so if I explain them wrong, please rightfully agree with me. This is this is not my area of expertise, but as I as I understand it, uh, in 1916, you have the Easter uprising during which uh, Irish Republic is proclaimed. Obviously, the British um, uh, crush it quite violently. A few years later, uh, the Republican Party, Sinn Féin, wins a landslide election, and they split from the parliament to form a breakaway government called Dali Iron, and they declare themselves to be the sort of independent Irish uh, republic that was created in 196 and they claim to be that government so they they win i believe in they win in parliamentary elections and then just form a a breakaway uh government and then at the end of the war there is a treaty between uh the irish republican army and this is the original ira the ira has had several variants over the years uh which is fighting for irish independence and um and the, the British, the treaty creates uh, not the Irish Republic of 1916. It, it creates an Irish free state, which remains a dominion in the British, in the British kingdom. Uh, the members of the government have to swear an oath of allegiance to the King of England. And the Ireland is partitioned with the North remaining part of the United Kingdom. And uh, a lot of people reject the treaty and at this point, you have a very violent civil war that is quite intense because it's literally people who are fighting on the same side uh, now now fighting each other. And you have sort of the free state, which is backed perversely by the British against what's what's called the anti-treaty IRA, the, the part of the IRA that that uh, refuses to to recognize the treaty or accept the treaty. And this is who the IRA is when the people refer to the IRA until the late 60s when there is uh, another splinter, I believe, between the official IRA and the provisional IRA. Um, but 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 anyway, so Ken Loach is, is a Marxist, and he, he talks about, when he's talking somehow every time a colony wants independence, the question of the agenda are, how do you get the imperialist out, and what kind of society do you build? There are usually bourgeois nationalists who say, let's change the flag and keep everything as it was. And then there's the revolutionaries who say, let's change the property laws. It's always a, a critical moment. And he's, of course, uh, echoing James Connolly, who is a famous Irish Republican who participated in the 1916 uh, Easter uprising and who is referenced in the film, who very famously said, you know, if you remove the English army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle. Unless you said about the organization, the Socialist Republic, your efforts will be in vain. England will still rule you through her capitalists, landlords, financiers, through the whole array of commercial institutions, etc. Uh, and, you know, this sounds like the beginning of a very didactic sort of Marxist lecture uh, uh uh, posing as a film, but it's actually an extremely engaging conventional film that does not water down the politics and, and does not sacrifice the film at all. So we, we sort of follow these two brothers, um, Damien and Teddy O'Donnell. Is that, did I get the name right? O'Donovan, O'Donovan. Damien and Teddy O'Donovan, uh, who uh teddy is the older brother and he is an ira commander or some sort of rank in the irish republican army uh and damien is a doctor and he's getting ready to leave ireland and go to to uh teach at a medical college or train in a medical college uh in in england in london and uh, as he's getting ready to leave, uh, a friend of theirs who's only 17 is murdered by the Black and Tans. They're this really vicious uh, paramilitary force. And I, I really, uh, the scene where the Black and Tans murder uh, this, this, this teenager because he won't say his name in English, he speaks, he speaks in, 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 in Irish, uh, 
it's really very good to me at correctly um, capturing what the struggle in Ireland is all about. I feel like for a lot of Americans in the United States, there's this perception that it's just a religious war between you know, two people who, who, or two groups of people who can't agree on religion, whereas this makes it really very clear that, you know, it's an issue of social domination, it's an issue of structural oppression, um, it's an issue of colonial domination, and then it's a national liberation struggle. And it, it's very interesting to me because I think the first time I, I watched this movie was during the Ferguson uprising, and, and I, I don't want to make false comparisons, but the scene where they, 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 the black and tans come in and make everyone give their name and occupation and harass them and, and then murder the one young boy for, for you know, not talking uh, in English. It really did have a lot of resonance to me with what was going on in the country at, at the time. And I, I, this was back when they still had the internet movie database message boards. They got rid of them because people were so racist and awful and appalling. And there was like a thread, like, this is exactly like Michael Brown. And I clicked on it and the guy was like, and that they both had it coming, like really horrible, terrible comment. But um, clearly he saw the connection, but from a very different perspective. Um, but so, so Damien is supposed to leave the country and he's, he's going through with it. But when he goes to board the train, the driver, Dan, lets the British soldiers know that the Union the train conductors union or train drivers union does not allow the transport of British soldiers and British military equipment on the trains. They beat the shit out of him uh, and he won't give up. He just keeps saying the union doesn't allow this. The union doesn't allow this. And it's a really great example of like workers power uh, in, in a struggle for liberation. So after witnessing that, he's inspired to go back. He joins the IRA. He joins the IRA, uh, I don't know what the unit structure of the IRA is at, at this point in time, but he joins the uh, whatever structure his brother Teddy is is in charge of, um, and you know they get captured because they uh, one of the members they do this ambush of British soldiers and a local landlord coerces um, this young man who's in their squadron in, into giving up information and. Um, they brutally torture uh, Teddy o Teddy O'Donovan. There's some really graphic scenes of torture in this movie. I have to I have to warn. It's very, you know, it's it's it accurately depicts I think war and oppression. Um, but it, it is hard to watch in in some scenes. But I do think it's important to, you know, show what this type of colonial occupation really looks like. And um, they're supposed to be executed, but one of the, the British soldiers is, is of Irish descent and helps some of them escape. He can't save all of them. And then um, Damien gets the task of executing, you know, the, the traitor. And it's a really gut-wrenching and, and very disturbing and morally challenging scene. Um, but but because it's this, this young man he's been friends with all his life and, you know, he's semi-literate they threatened his mother, you know, all, all types of things. And, you know, there's a debate about whether or not they should do it. They ultimately follow the IRA orders. And, and you know, right when he goes to, to do it, he says to someone else, I sure hope this Ireland we're fighting for is worth it. And this is a really important moment in his character development. And I, I, I saw it a number of times for really picking up on that scene because that's where he is committed to sort of the full social revolution perspective right he has to go through with not just changing the color of the flag but but actually you know a, a revolution that liberates the people um you see throughout the film these sorts of tensions between the two sides of the struggle and then at the end um the civil war comes and his brother uh ends up in the free state army and he ends up in the anti-treaty IRA, and then they're on they're on the same side of the Civil War. I don't want to spoil the ending. I know it's this film is from 2006, but I think Kevin, you can attest the ending is extraordinarily uh, jarring. And yeah, uh, well, we don't have to say what's going on, but these are the brothers that you're referring to, and uh, you don't have to talk about the scene. But this, no, this comes knows. towards the end okay. of the film. Okay, everyone knows what, how it ends now. Okay, yep. 
Well, I mean, we don't really know what's happening here. I, there's, there's maybe some clues, but you. Can... Anyways, uh, leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it murky, leave it murky. If you haven't Don't seen it, ending. it's uh, it it fits the tone of the film though, it right? Does. Like it does. Like the the ending matches with what we're watching because every stage as it appears there's something that has taken place that could give you the promise of liberation is that the best way to put it uh there's something that you learn that gives you the sense that it's not there yet like every time you feel like you've gotten to that point of justice there's something that is thrown into the plot that makes it clear they're they are far from it right like yeah yeah i i i don't think that's an incorrect summation i mean i i was familiar with the i a little bit familiar with the irish civil war so i, I knew uh damien and the socialist revolution were not going to win out um yeah but i i uh what happens to damien the first time i saw it i was just floored it was very jarring uh-huh. ending um well, and like you say, there's there's actual scenes of torture in the film, which yes. so like convey the, the the brutality. And a lot of times, when you think of war films that you watch, especially in U.S. cinema, you're left to like get swept away by it and feel like you want to root for some people and be on the side of them. And the the violence is such that like. Uh, sanitized yeah well no not sanitized but like even if it is gory um it, it you sort of feel like you're on the side of the people who are fighting for their survival and then when they come out alive uh, you feel a sense of triumph um the, the the gore is justified it's like in this case i'm saying the gore is unjustified but it's like whoa you're not watching it going Man, I'm pumped that these people are fighting on the battlefield. It's it's a complete and different reaction that you get to what you're seeing, right? Yeah, I, and I think it's I do think it's very clear Ken Loach sympathizes with the Irish Republican Army. It's very clear he sympathizes with the anti-treaty IRA, whose members he depicts as having very developed socialist ideology. I, I, I don't know how socialist or not socialist the anti-treaty side was. I feel like the you know partition and oath to a king was probably a, a bigger deal than the workers will be tied to the factory bench, as Dan says in, in, in the film. Um, but, I mean, you know, that scene where they shoot Chris Riley, I mean, that is really... Um, it's rough, and I don't. I mean, he doesn't sanitize. I mean, the people have criticized the film for showing the British as worse. Obviously, the British were worse. I mean, they're the ones who are the colonial occupiers. But um, it, 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 I don't. It doesn't hide the fact that you know war is violent, and you know, terrible things happen. And even if you are on the quote unquote right side, well, it's tearing people apart. Like the families are being torn, and yeah. Pit, pitted against each other, literal, quite literally, with, brother with the brothers brother. being against, yeah, brother against brother. The, the famous uh, uh, Civil War cliche, and in this film it is. Yeah, it, it is, that's interesting. It is carrying a, 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 a trope in Civil War stories. Uh, all right, so uh, let's play your clips. Do you want to play the clips? Scene? Can I set the scene for the clips? Sure. So right after they return from hiding with after they've been captured, they come back to a town that is under the control of the IRA, and there's a Republican court. Uh, because the men are at war, the women are judges. This is very fascinating. Uh, and they're hearing a dispute between a local merchant, a big wig, uh, and a woman he lent money to to buy groceries. In the course of the court proceedings, she didn't pay him back, so he takes her to court to, to sue her. And in the course of the court proceedings, it is discovered that he has charged her 500% interest. Uh, the judges are outraged and livid at him. And they um, 
they order him to pay back the money plus some sort of penalty fee, which drives him insane because he won't do it. And then they order him like jail for contempt of court. And as they're taking him away, Teddy O'Donovan, the IRA leader, sneaks him out of the courthouse, much to the air of the uh, of the judges. And, you know, one of which who yells at him, you know, this is not an English court. This is a Republican court when, when talking about how he's abused his position in the community to charge this this elderly woman who needs money for groceries, uh, 500 percent interest. But then the he is also very important for buying weapons uh, and giving financial support to the IRA. So, you know, the, the leaders help him escape the court of the government. They're supposedly defending a, a just government and it provokes this internal uh dispute within the column and everyone in this scene is 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 ira there's a couple of like i think that's important to mention so let's let's hit the clip who the hell do you think you are to interfere with the court's decision lily calm down for a second answer the question by whose authority you answer my question do you want every merchant and businessman in the county up against us with decisions like that you're interfering with the court decisions by your actions teddy are you going to throw me in jail too who will fight the war then? You? What Mr. Sweeney did to Mrs. Rafferty was wrong, Teddy, and you can't cut it. It was wrong, but I need the man's money to buy weapons. What am I going to do without weapons? We can't fight a war like that. Are you going to fight it with a hurl? How are we supposed to maintain the trust of the people? Would you undermining the court? We'll maintain the trust of the people with weapons in our hands because we have men on the four corners of this town defending this town at this very moment in time. We took it from the British with force. And the first judgment of this, an independent court, you have undermined by deciding to settle it in a pub. He provides us with money to buy weapons. There's a consignment I'm coming in. Afford there is that? a consignment coming in from Glasgow in the next few weeks. You tell me how I'm going to pay for that if he's sitting down in the cell sulking. We, sh gonna we should enforce the court's decision. <clears throat> I'm volunteering. Anyone else? Go ahead. And that's Danny with the train driver. Yeah. Liam Cunningham. We have one objective to get the British out of Ireland. And the Sweeney's of this world give us rifles. More important than a box of fucking groceries. A little clarity now in the name of God. Well said, Rory, boy. Well said. Now we'll paint the town Republican green. But underneath, we're still the same as the English. Is that no, we're saying? not the same but as the English. Than, yeah, if we we're not the same. better than painting it fucking red anyway. You tear up this, you tear up these. Ah, the shut up, easy. easy. Justice and equality for all. Technical, you need a proclamation. Just grant, just grant. What are you guys finding this funny? Oh, yes. Turn out your pockets, lads. Come on, how much money have you got in your pocket? Be careful there, no, Daniel. Hang on, be quiet there, be quiet. How much money have you got? What are you talking about? Come on, can you not answer a civil question? How much money have you got? Answer him, Tim. How much? Well, we shouldn't, all right? All right, Ned. How much land do you own? Answer me, come on. Have you played a grass to your name? No, I'm not a big no. Let me father. finish. I'm talking here. Right, you're paupers, just like me. Now you're going to take a look up and down this country and see the amount of volunteers that are involved in land seizures and cattle drives. Now, do you want to know why that's happening, do you? That's enough for that. It's not enough of it. The IRA are backing the landlords and crushing people like you and me. No. Down, Let, I'm, talking talking I'm talking here. I'm talking here. What do you want, man? Madness? Hold on a minute. Me. Hold on a minute. You saw it here two minutes ago. These boys back in the local big wig. And, and selling out a mother who hasn't got a penny in her pocket. He's just like yours. Now, Teddy, I have no, Teddy, I have no problem. No problem taking any order you want to give me. I will, I, I'll jump off a cliff if you want. You, you show us how better, better respect this court. Dan. This is, this is our government. All right. So as you see there, you see an example of this sort of split within the Irish Republican movement between those who really think that driving out the British requires building a more just society, building a more equitable society, which is which is a, a you know clearly they're clearly socialist. Um, that's explicit in, in the film and, and based on the uh, one comment the man yelled, "It's better than painting it fucking red." <laughs> uh, um, yeah, and those who you know, prioritize independence. We have one objective, that's to get the English out. And that's uh, rifles more important than a box of groceries. Yep, yeah. Uh, you can't actually fight a war without food. Yeah, I'll just say one quote I put down that I especially enjoyed in the film. Damien stands up in the church and yeah. he yells, he yells at the Catholic preacher doing the sermon 
Once again, the Catholic Church, with honorable exception, sides with the rich. I, I was originally going to pick that as my clip because that's the clip people usually pick. It's um, a good one. I mean, he lays down the the priest lays down that the church is going to not be a space for free thought and uh, exchange of ideas. And um, that anybody who is deemed disloyal, the, the church is going to participate in excommunicating them yes. and also see to it that they can't join other churches. And uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very good scene. You will be denied Holy Communion if you reject the treatment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Basically to uh, deprive them of uh, being their, their entire identity is Irish Catholics taken away. And the priest is also very upset about the propaganda the anti-treaty IRA is, is distributing where they mention uh, seizing the lands of the aristocracy who lives in London. And he says, not content with stealing your savings, they'll be nationalizing the 12 apostles next. <laughs> yeah, like absurdism. I'm not, I'm not really, I don't know how we go from like your savings to the lands of the aristocracy who live in luxury in London. Um, that's that's quite an assumption about the social class of the church, and also, I don't know how one nationalized the twelve apostles. You're right. I suspect would want to be nationalized. I mean, they were a pretty uh, communal society. All right. Uh, should we go on to? Yeah, let's do yours. Uh, okay. So my film, and we're gonna get the whole title onto the screen. Uh, I've got. Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Uh, this is, in my view, uh, one of the, this is my top five films. This is definitely one of my all-time favorites. And that's been a good place for us to start, Chip, to do our uh, favorite films as we get going with our show. So uh, if you go back to uh, the first episode and the second episode, uh, Chip and I have been doing our favorite films for these shows. And uh, this one, you know, though, uh, I suppose I went with it rather than waiting to do it later because of the moment in which we find ourselves. But uh, I'm not really going to get into that. I, I talk about that a lot outside the film uh, all the time on my social media. And I've done my own YouTube broadcasts digging into geopolitical issues of the moment. I will really stay focused on the film and and just uh, get into some of the uh, things that are, um, it, you know, why I find it to be one of the best. And I'm not the only one, obviously. It's critically acclaimed Stanley Kubrick film. And as it says there, 1964. So uh, we're deep into the Cold War as this film is produced. There's a disclaimer at the beginning of the film. Uh, and it, they they say uh, this the scroll is fantastic. The stated position of the U.S. Air Force is that safeguards would prevent the event in this film from happening. That's okay. Before you even get into the story and know what's happening with uh, what they're holding there, that's top secret plan R. Uh, before you even know what's going to hit you with Doctor Strangelove, uh, you already get this disclaimer of like, well the government doesn't like what this film is doing. And so you see that. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, we, we meet, we meet Ripper. We meet, we meet this man, take down the, we meet, uh, we meet Jack Ripper, who is this general who um, is, I mean, like, if you want to put it in the context of today, He's um, he, he's a, he's a crackpot general who you could guess is if, if he was alive today, he'd certainly be reading Alex Jones's Infowars in order to get his perspective on the world around him. He'd certainly be digging through all the worst Reddits coming up with his own ideas about threats to the United States that were not best based in reality. I mean, he might be someone like a Michael Flynn or uh, some other person like that who has com completely gone off the deep end. And, uh, you know, he talks, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and quote the, 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 the best line ever uttered by Sterling Hayden, 
which is um, that there's an international com communist conspiracy to sap and, imp and impurify all of our precious bodily fluids. And uh, that's the way in which uh, he presents the threat. Uh, so the anti-communism is uh, something that drives him to kickstart this pro procedure, this, uh, this plan that can't be called back and so effectively, you've got all the planes are deployed and uh, they're going to launch a nuclear attack on uh, the Soviet Union. And again, um, he's, he's developed it in a way that nothing can stop his plan, uh, not even the, the president of the United States, who is... Uh, so continuing, uh, we get to the war room. Uh, the war room is this iconic set. Uh, it's an incredible set. It's one of the most recognizable and uh, I think one of the best sets in cinematic history. And uh, you've, you've got all these generals gathered around. You've got some politicians, some diplomats are in the war room. And... Uh, You've got President Merkin, who is seated at the table, but you've also got um, you've got this general. You've got the general played by George C. Scott, who's Academy Award-winning actor, Buck Turgeson, and he is there uh, running through the Plan R, describing how these people in the plane are carrying out this attack. Uh, well, we see the plane. I think there are other planes that are involved in the attack as well. But the plane that we follow that is involved in launching these uh, missiles uh, that, that are going to drop these nuclear payloads are it's being flown by uh, Slim Pickens. And it also see James Earl Jones in one of his earliest roles. And they're in the, the plane. And... Uh, so here Turgeson is running through the different uh, aspects of Plan R. And um, as he describes it, uh, you hear Buck Turgeson talk about how uh, he's presenting a choice. He would like the United States to uh, prepare a retaliation right now, some kind of a response to hit the Russians and catch them off guard even as the deployment is happening, all because it is the issue of whether there's going to be 20 million killed or uh, somewhere on the order of 100 million people killed. And he says, you can do this right now and you'll knock everything out and you can just kill 20 million. And that prompts uh, President Merkin, who's played by Peter Sellers, to say that what you're talking about is mass murder, not war. Uh, so um, here we have um, uh, my favorite scene. Uh, the clip will be playing uh, of him calling the uh, prime minister in Soviet Union, Dmitry, and sitting next to him is the Russian ambassador. Uh, this is President Merkin uh, letting the prime minister know that, in fact, there are U.S. planes coming to bomb his country. Uh, so uh, then uh, as this progresses, uh, we see a constant escalation. There's action happening on uh, the base where uh, we see that Jack Ripper is taking matters into his own hands. There's another character by Peter Sellers, Colonel Mandrake, who would like to stop this somehow, but can't. And he uh, finds himself uh, struggling and faced with uh, an assault. The, the base comes under assault because that's the only way that uh, the war room decides that they could get to Jack Ripper. Jack Ripper does this thing that is really appropriate for the time. Uh, when he launches the assault... Uh, he decides that he must impound all of the radios that are on the base. So you see this very comical 
cart being pushed around in one scene that's loaded with what look to be like 50 to 75 different radios that have been collected. They've been impounded. Uh, the people on the base are basically ordered to wall off their minds and not listen to any transmissions that are coming into the base that would uh, allow the Ruskies to uh, get to them and affect their resolve in carrying out their act. So with the radio communications completely cut off, there's no way to get to the base and turn these planes around. Uh, so uh, you see this play out. And then of course, uh, in the in the war room, uh, let's get this, in the war room we have uh, Dr. Strangelove who is there uh, sharing his expertise. Uh, he's the one who educates uh, the president on the existence of the doomsday machine and how it is actually possible to have a doomsday machine. Uh, the Soviet Union or the USSR has this doomsday machine. Uh, there's a really good line in there of where the only way that the doomsday machine could be effective as a deterrent is if the U.S. Knew, knows about the existence and they don't. And then the Russian ambassador says, well, we were planning to announce it the following Monday. Uh, so uh, that's why it was never out there as a deterrent. Uh, but in fact, uh, Dr. Strangelove describes how it could be a deterrent, uh, not in this particular scene. This is actually the very end of the film right here, but he describes the uh, way in which the doomsday machine is in fact possible and the way it would, would work. And that's when they begin to sort through and finally uh, go through the different scenarios uh, discussing different things about humanity and how it could continue. And meanwhile, this operation is unfolding. And the great thing about this film is that every uh, moment we are constantly escalating. We see all these players uh, and the different moving parts happening. And uh, it's, it's, it's really brilliant in the way that it's presented and the, 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 the structure of it uh, the, 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 the different pieces are, are balanced very well by Stanley Kubrick, uh, until they all come to that climactic moment, the climactic scene in which, uh, you do see the, uh, uh, that iconic scene where he's on the, the warhead writing it down. And, uh, you know, there's some other things that we could say about the film, but, uh, I'll get to the phone call, but um, just when I when I was watching Don't Look Up earlier uh, back in December, I thought about this movie because this is the movie in which all satires have basically been measured for the last, well, uh, more than a half century now. And when you look at cinema, most of the political satires are either imitating Dr. Strangelove or when they get released, most of the critics will look at these films and they'll say, you know, is that, is that like Dr. Strangelove or does it succeed? Uh, or they'll say, and it's usually negative, you know, it's, it's not as good as Dr. Strangelove. So it is basically the way in which uh, political satires are understood now when you have a movie that's released. And I actually felt like, you know, without getting into it, that there were aspects of Don't Look Up that are very similar and identical to Dr. Strangelove um, that builds on that, that tradition. Uh, I mean, they have, there, there is some way in the structure that they're similar, like even those end scenes where, uh, you've got nuclear Armageddon happening and it's completely out of control. And then the end scene for Don't Look Up, even when you compare that, you can see some similarity. But the way in which the players are, uh, there's only like a few that are trying meaningfully. Uh, well, there's even less in Dr. Strangelove. In Dr. Strangelove, there's even less people trying to stop something. Um, and, in, and in fact, uh, Dr. Strangelove is uh, potentially more frightening because 
the players involved are responsible for what is unfolding, but yet they don't have any idea how to stop it. And so that is uh, something that I think uh, the, the comedy, the comedy that you see, especially Colonel Mandrake is essentially our conscience. Like he's the person who knows exactly what is happening and how bad it is and how it's not going to, uh, that we're, we have a very limited amount of time in order to stop it from continuing. And as he has that sense of panic and tries to impress uh, the one officer who takes him in as a POW from the base, as he tries to impress upon him the urgency and the officer who's taken him in as a POW doesn't really understand what is going on around him. You know, Man Mandrake is that straight character. And like every comedy has a straight character. Uh, I'm not talking about sexual orientation, but like that straight person that's not trying to be comical and play for laughs. Whereas like all the other characters in the comedy, uh, Dr. Strangelove, Demet uh, I mean, even uh, the president, uh, the president's sort of a straight character. And, uh, but then Buck Turgidson and, and Jack Ripper, you know, those are all caricature-ish types um, that are presented by Stanley Kubrick in the film. And then Colonel Mandrake is really the straight up officer who is taking this all in and recognizing what's going on with Plan R. Um, and, and then of course, with Slim Pickens on the airplane, you've got that caricature, uh, the yeehaw cowboy who is going to battle. Um, and uh, both, I'd say both Slim Pickens character and Jack Ripper represent that, uh, the, the most cartoonish aspects of anti-communism that exists, existed during that time. And I've pulled this up before we do the clip just because uh, this is this is one thing that always uh, I always remember because Daniel Ellsberg did the book The Doomsday Machine on this. I just think it's it's worth getting this in here. Just how accurate this film is. Um, Ellsberg has called this the Pentagon Papers whistleblower. Daniel Ellsberg has called this a documentary. Uh, because everything in that film existed as an operational reality at the time. Uh, the specific doomsday machine in Dr. Strangelove is fictional, but the Russian and American nuclear arsenals function as de facto doomsday machines. Oh, by the way, he's talking about now, uh, just if, if you weren't already frightened enough about the world around you. Uh, he's talking about now and how this film still applies to today because a first strike by either power against the other would be more than enough to plunge the world into nuclear winter. And Ellsberg said, if the U S had followed their actual plans and did what they were supposed to do under wartime contingency, it would have destroyed nearly all human life. And in that case, he's talking about back um, in the late fifties, early sixties, which is what Dr. Strangelove is pre presenting. The idea for the doomsday machine in Dr. Strangelove was inspired by real life thinking of Herman Kahn, uh, who was a colleague of Ellsberg at the Rand Corporation. Kahn's words are actually quoted in the movie and he himself wanted a cut. Kahn demanded uh, some royalties. Kubrick had to assure him that that was not the way filmmaking worked. Uh, but he says, uh, there's not a lot that has changed. Um, in fact, there's time for another, we, we should have another Dr. Strangelove or at least a revival of it and I would be very interested in reactions uh, from the Pentagon to the movie. Uh, but yeah, this was uh, a film that I know when Ellsberg first saw it, he was just stunned at the accuracy of the picture. Um, the other thing is uh, the production designer, um, I believe his name is Ken Adam. Uh, this, 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 this piece of trivia, and then we'll get to the clip and wrap this up. In the early 1960s, the B-52 was cutting edge technology. So that's the plane that you see uh, as a model. They didn't actually get access to the B-52. They read the script, the Pentagon did, and as is typical, they still do this today. When they don't want to support a film, you don't get to use the equipment, uh, which is absolutely unfair, but that's the way the process works for filmmakers. 
So that's why most of the films with military support are straight propaganda. Set designers reconstructed the B-52 bomber's cockpit from a single photograph that appeared in a British flying magazine when some Air Force personnel from the U.S. were invited to view the movie's B-52 cockpit, they said it was a perfect copy, and that led Stanley Kubrick to be afraid that Ken Adam, who was the production designer, that his team had used illegal methods and may be placed under investigation by the FBI. So he was like, you, I, you better have gotten this from sources that are not top secret. That was basically all he said. Uh, but it's very faithful, um, very good. Um, and yeah. Um, so let's get to this clip. Let's play the clip. I'm going to play uh, the scene in which Dimitri and President Merkin, uh, well, President Merkin makes the phone call to the prime minister. Hello. Uh, hello, Di hello, Dimitri. Listen, I, I can't hear too well. Do you suppose you could turn the music down just a little? Oh, that's much better. Yeah. Yes. Fine, I can hear you now, Dimitri. Clear and plain and coming through fine. I'm coming through fine too, eh? Good, then. Well, then, as you say, we're both coming through fine. Good. Well, it's good that you're fine and, and I'm fine. I agree with you. It's great to be fine. <laughs> now then, Dimitri, you know how we've always talked about the possibility of something going wrong with the bomb. <laughs> the bomb, Dimitri. The hydrogen bomb. Well, now, what happened is um, one of our base commanders, he had a sort of well, he went a little funny in the head, you know, just a little funny. And uh, he went and did a silly thing. Well, I'll tell you what he did. He ordered his planes to attack your country. <laughs> well, let me finish, Dimitri. Let me finish, Dimitri. Well, listen, how do you think I feel about it? Can you imagine how I feel about it, Dimitri? Why do you think I'm calling you? Just to say hello? Of course I like to speak to you. Of course I like to say hello. Not now, but anytime, Dimitri. I'm just calling up to tell you something terrible has happened. It's a friendly call. Of course it's a friendly call. Listen, if it wasn't friendly, you probably wouldn't have even got it. All right, so that's how it all will end. That's that's, that's the conversation. The, that's the level of conversation I expect amongst global leaders as the that's, rollbacks. That's what they're having, you know. They he's calling. Well, if they even do talk, um, most of them have intermediaries now, and they're talking. Uh, the the I feel you, like when you accidentally unleash a nuclear holocaust, you call directly. <laughs> I think it's a bit of a faux pas. He's intermediate. At, yeah. Right. Okay. I'll accept that. That after there's no way of going back that then you put on that cordial tone and, and try to talk to your adversary. Yeah. That's probably right. Uh, would have just tweeted it out. Oh, by the way, since uh, uh, it, in line with the socialism of today's sh uh, of this month's show, I'm obligated to just say uh, one more thing about the this film and a scene, uh, a scene that, by the way, doesn't get a lot of attention because there are many, many better scenes uh, that where Peter Sellers steals the show as Dr. Strangelove and I think at George C. Scott, and of course. But the scene towards the end uh, that's amazing is... Uh, when the officer is pointing a gun at Colonel Mandrake and Colonel Mandrake's trying to make a collect call to the president uh, or the, yeah, to talk to the president and inform them of what's happening. And uh, he didn't have quarter. He needs a quarter for the phone call. There's a Coca-Cola machine that is in the hall and 
uh, this is the line that the officer who has taken him in as a POW says, that's private property. If you don't get the president on the phone, you're going to have to answer to the Coca-Cola company. <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. <laughs> I just love it. You're going to have to answer to the Coca-Cola company. I don't even know what that would be like. What, can, what, is, what, is, what does Coke do to one that has violated their vending machine? Uh, we don't want to find out. You, you don't want to know. Uh, it's strange love the character, and I also think this is quite ahead of the time. I mean, he's literally a Nazi, right? I mean, he can't resist Zeg Heiling, which there was a number of Nazi scientists under Operation Paperclip, that w which I don't think was even public at this point, was it? That were brought to this country. Yeah, I don't know. He, he shouts Mein Fuhrer to the President of the United States while in... Uh, his, uh, yeah, his expression of uh, things that you'd expect a Nazi to say are basically like Tourette's for Dr. Yes. Strangelove in the yes. film. Yeah, yeah. So the Nazis, the Nazism comes off as like a, a compulsion that they can't be controlled. He, he can't control his worst Nazi thoughts. So, uh, yeah, uh, spectacular. And obviously... Uh, not not only like a top five for me, it constantly makes the top five best comedies of all time lists. Uh, I mean, it's enduring and uh, it's not, you know, look, it's not the comedy. Uh, when I first learned about it, I was I was young. I watched this when I was uh, like I so I would I was someone who sought out comedies like Blazing Saddles and uh, like the class, the, the classic spoof comedies. And, so, and then I go to Dr. Strangelove and I watch it. And I was like, man, this is not a knee slapper of a film. Like this isn't, this isn't like a funny ha ha movie. There's lots of serious dark. You have to really get what's going on. And there's no way that someone who is, you know, nine or 10 years old is going to understand Dr. Strangelove. But I knew that it was a classic and I wanted to see it. And, uh, and I mean, only now I think having become familiar with the issues, do I grasp all of the humor in it, but, and I'm glad that I've, I've had this film in my life. So anyways, it was good talking with you, Chip. Always a pleasure, Kevin. It's great to do another show. I'm and glad the show to distract from the usual depressing conversations we have. And we picked two extremely depressing films. So we are, we are, we are on good footing. <laughs> Come on, give yourself credit. It still was an escape from talking about whatever is on the CNN right now that we don't want to see. That we like the images that we know we don't want to see. Like these, I I think the people watching our show would rather see uh, bleak IRA films or Doctor Strange Love, Madcap, Nuclear Armageddon comedy before most of what. Jake yeah, Tapper. most of what they're seeing from around the world at this moment. So I think I don't know. Uh, while we touched upon it, we 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 didn't really uh, we didn't really bring the worst of the world into our show, and so I, I view that as a success. Yes, uh, I mean I, I listen. I intentionally stayed away from drawing real life parallels because I think you know the movie. The the amazing thing about this movie and then your movie as well is that it's a kind of enduring thing that like no matter what no matter what war we're talking about um and unfortunately no matter what conflict we're talking about between two major superpowers it's going to resonate because of the universality of the story yeah so all right. Uh, well, like we said, we're going to come back for another show in April. You're not getting rid of us. Are you doing, <laughs> is that the 40th anniversary of Blade Runner or? That one. That... Uh, so I'm going to save that for okay. June, June because uh, that is when the anniversary is. Uh, that's a, that's about the time for that anniversary. So, okay. so yeah, Chip uh, <laughs> is right. I'm looking to do Blade Runners. Uh, and by the time we've done that, I will have done three of my top four films. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure what I'll do for April. 
Maybe I'll do something like Dark City is really good. Maybe I'll maybe I'll come with that one. Uh, just just so we can have something different. I like doing Ocean's Eleven, and uh, that was that was fun. Uh, maybe I'll come with like a popcorn flick. Who knows? Well, I keep thinking about doing Batman Returns. So I keep making a joke about being my favorite German expressionist film. Although then I saw those kids, our competitors. Uh, I sent you that clip, right? Talking about Batman Returns, and I don't, I don't know how our level of discourse could uh, do better than theirs. So come on, rise to the challenge. Think, do, do it. Every, do it. Kids love penguins. Presents. We used to attack children. No one has any idea what we're referencing. It was this <laughs> bizarre children's television show from 1992 where children review movies a clip of it of them reviewing batman returns was trending on twitter like i have no idea why it's like batman and it's one of my favorite batman films so i clicked it and it's like it's all these people sharing like this arc clip of this kid talking about batman returns on tv <laughs> and it's hilarious the content all right. Well, I feel like we're running out of internet because I'm All glitchy. Right. You're glitchy. Uh, we should wrap this up. But thanks everyone for watching our movie show. We'll be back next week, uh, next month. We'll be back next, next month. month with another episode.